Did you know you can capture beautiful photos of the Milky Way and deep sky objects with photography gear you may already have? If you want to get started with deep sky astrophotography with just a camera, a lens, and a tripod, then this video will show you every step of the process, including planning, capturing, and editing your photos. Hi everyone, my name is Nico Carver. I'm a deep sky astrophotographer and my website is at nebulaphotos.com. And this YouTube channel is all about helping beginners get started with astrophotography, which I think is the most fun and rewarding hobby out there. I'll also just mention briefly here at the start that I do have a Patreon to support this channel. And um, I wanna thank everyone who's already supporting me on Patreon, it really means a lot. And if you're interested in joining, my Patreon starts at just $1 a month. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to capture deep sky objects. And by that, I mean objects out in space that are outside of our solar system. And specifically, we'll be capturing nebulae. That's just the plural for nebula. Um, and we're gonna be capturing the nebulae in the core of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, our framing is gonna include the lagoon, Trifid, Omega and Eagle Nebulae. And if you've seen my previous No Tracker video where we captured the Orion Nebula, this one's gonna be sort of similar, but um, a little different, especially the processing. And to keep it interesting, I'm also gonna be shooting with not just one camera, but two. I have here a stock Canon 60D, and then I also bought a Canon 60D that's been modified for astrophotography. And that means it, it fully passes the hydrogen alpha emission line. The, the idea in really simple terms is that red nebulae should appear brighter and a bit more detailed and a bit more red in the final picture with this camera compared to this camera. So anyways, I'll be shooting the same patch of sky with both cameras, and then we'll compare the results at the end of the video to see how much of a difference a modified DSLR makes uh, when we're doing untracked astrophotography, just meaning astrophotography without a star tracker or an equatorial mount. But the main focus of this video is just learning the steps. So uh, I'm gonna show you every step of how I'm gonna plan this out, capture, and edit some photos of the core of the Milky Way. It's sort of like a Milky Way photography where we are shooting the Milky Way core and we'll see it, but um, it, I'm not doing a really wide angle Milky Way photography with landscape. We're gonna be shooting at 50 millimeter, um, a little bit more zoomed in on and trying to feature the deep sky objects. Um, because I'm gonna show every step and detail along the way, I know this video is gonna be long, but there is gonna be a table of contents with timestamps in the description, so feel free to skip ahead if you want. Um, there's a lot to go over. If you just wanna see the processing, just skip to that. Also in the description will be a link to my website with sample files, exactly what I'm shooting. So if you want to follow along with the processing part using the same files I'm working with, then you can. All right, enough intro, let's get into it. So let's start with the three pieces of equipment you'll need to take pictures of a deep sky object. And luckily, they're things I think most photographers already have. The first thing you'll need is a tripod. And for astrophotography, the sturdier the tripod, the better. However, sometimes when you're traveling, um, especially to a, a dark site, maybe uh, somewhere you know exotic, you'll need something small. And um, so for this shot, I'm gonna be using my backpacking tripod, which is this Mi Photo Road Trip. It's uh, under $100 new, I believe, and it will work fine for this purpose. The main thing you wanna make sure with a tripod that has a ball head like this one is that it's designed to support your camera and lens and that you can tighten it down nice and tight so that it doesn't slowly droop under the weight of the camera and lens when you're doing long exposures. It really needs to stay put and not move so that we get nice round stars. Um, and sometimes what you'll find is that the tripod is fine, 
but the ball head that it came with is not up to the job. In that case, you can just go to a store like B&H and find a replacement uh, ball head with good reviews and specs in your price range. And when I say specs, I mean, you really wanna get something that's weighted for much more weight than you're putting on it. Then when you get your replacement ball head, all you do is you unscrew the old one and you put on the new one. So this is a, a ball head out of Germany that's weighted for 60 pounds. It's been pretty good to me. Um, and the thing I like about it is that you can, you can really loosen this ball head up and then you can do this friction tightening like this. And so then it's pretty secure, but then you can really lock it down with this knob. And now it's like incredibly secure and it's not gonna move at all. Okay, for the camera, as I mentioned, I'll be using the Canon 60D which is not the newest and greatest that Canon makes. But a big part of my motivation here is to show you that you can do this with the camera that you have. Don't feel like you have to go out and buy a new camera, for instance. Just use what you have first. Um, and as I said in the intro, I have a stock 60D, and then I have this uh, modified 60D. I bought both of these cameras used. Um, they're not available new. The stock 60D was $300 on eBay, and the modified 60D was $400, so just $100 more on Cloudy Nights Classifieds, which is a really uh, great forum. And then the Classifieds is a good place to buy used astrophotography gear. On both cameras, I installed something called Magic Lantern Firmware. And what that is, is it's additional firmware that you put on the SD card, and so you just take the SD card out, you put it into your computer, you add it to this, and then you can install it. And it does break your warranty because there are certain risks with hacking your camera a little bit. But since these are both out of warranty and I've used Magic Lantern before, I wasn't so concerned about that aspect of it, but maybe you should be, so just fair warning. But the reason I'll be using Magic Lantern tonight is for the built-in intervalometer that that adds to Canon cameras. And an intervalometer is just a fancy word for an interval timer, meaning something that can take a programmed sequence of photos. So you could set up your camera to take a two second photo, wait a second or two for the mirror to settle, then take another photo and on and on like that for as long as you set it to go. So you can set it for 100, 200 photos, walk away from your setup so that you're not messing with it. And tonight we're gonna do that, we're gonna take hundreds of photos of the same patch of sky. And again, the reason for taking hundreds of photos is to lower the random noise in each shot um, by stacking them together and averaging them. This is something that we called image stacking. And we'll, we're gonna see that in, you know, in action in the processing section of this video. Anyways, back to intervalometers. You may find that your camera already has an internal intervalometer or interval timer that you can access through the menus. Um, a lot of Fuji, Panasonic cameras have those. Um, and maybe, or maybe you could add an intervalometer with something like Magic Lantern, that's what I'm doing. Another good option is to buy a small external intervalometer like this one by Newer. I'll have some links in the description if you're interested. It costs about $35 and most uh, DSLRs or mirrorless cameras will have uh, the ability to just plug something like this right in. Um, just make sure you get the intervalometer that's designed for your camera. And uh, basically all I have to do then is just uh, program the sequence in right here on the front using the buttons. And then when I'm ready, um, it's all set up and focused. I just press start on here. It starts taking photos. And I've set this up to take a photo every few seconds. And then on the camera, I have that set to take two second pictures. And it'll just keep taking photos uh, for as long as you set it to do it. So I just set it to take four photos and it just took four. Um, very easy to operate and works really well. Okay, another option though, even cheaper if you don't wanna spend $35, is you can just get a cable release. This is like $10, Mikey, and goes into the same port on your camera. And then what we can do is either just, you know, sit back on a chair and just take the pictures one by one with that, or you can set your camera on continuous drive mode rather than single shooting. And then just 
um, lock the cable release. And then what it'll do is there's no delay. It'll just keep taking photos one after another. So not quite as good. The reason is, is because um, with the DSLR, uh, the mirror is going up and down, so you might get some vibration that way. But I've actually tested this and didn't get any vibration in my photos, but you'll have to try it. Uh, if you already have a cable release, it might be a good option. And finally, yet another option for newer cameras is to use apps on your smartphone to control your camera. Um, these 60Ds that I have are too old. They don't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth communication, so I can't show that working. But I have tried uh, this with my newer cameras, and it can work just fine. They basically talk with the, the smartphone over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or both, and then you can control the camera and set up a sequence of shots. So there are many options for actually taking the photos. The thing we're trying to avoid is actually touching the camera's shutter button to take the photos. So like this. The reason is, is that just by pressing it like that, even if you're on a steady tripod, you'll get some vibration shake by doing that. If that's your only option, you don't have any other way to control the camera, then what I would recommend is just put it on a two second delay, and almost any camera has something like that, like a timer mode, and then you press the button and completely remove your hand and try to stay very still while it's taking the picture too, of course, because you don't want the ground to move, and that, that can work. I've, I've tried it, it's a little tedious, but it does work. For the lens, I'll be using Canon's Nifty 50, on both my 60Ds. Um, this is officially their 50 millimeter f1.8 STM lens. And it's regularly $125, but it also regularly goes on sale for about $99 new. So I picked up both of my copies at 99. Um, and I'll be shooting at a focal ratio of f2, meaning the aperture is gonna be stopped down just a little bit from wide open Wide open on these is f1.8. And the reason to stop down, meaning making the aperture opening inside the lens smaller, is typically lenses perform a bit better with star shape when stopped down. Meaning wide open, a corner star may look a little like a little seagull when we zoom in on it. Uh, see it's sort of messed up. But stopped down a bit, the stars look more like they should, little pinpoints of light. However, the trade-off of stopping down the aperture at all is whenever you stop down, you're letting in less light, less light is hitting the sensor. Since the aperture opening is getting smaller, remember the aperture is a fraction. So with each stop on the scale from F2 to F2.8 to F4, you're letting in half as much light each time you stop it down. And so if possible for this tutorial, I would shoot at f4 or wider, meaning f4, f2.8, f2, etc. Um, but if your lens only goes as wide as, let's say, f5.6, meaning that's the smallest number, the smallest f ratio, then don't let that stop you from trying. It's just not as ideal for untracked astrophotography since we're dealing with such short exposures since we're not tracking. As a quick aside, um, if you do have a tracker, then these so-called slower focal ratios of like f5.6, f6, f7, those will work just fine um, because we can easily do much longer exposures because we're tracking. So uh, you basically counteract the fact that you're not letting in as much light by tracking and doing a much longer exposure. Uh, but there are limits to this, like you don't, we don't want to do deep sky astrophotography at something like f22 because there's just not going to be enough light to make that work. If you have a selection of lenses or a zoom lens, the next thing we need to pick is the focal length. And so I would strongly advise staying at 100 millimeters or under. So 50, 80, 70, all those are good. If you've tried untracked astrophotography before and you want to experiment with some of these higher focal lengths, then go for it. But for your first time out, I think the sweet spot of what we're trying to do, which is capturing bright deep sky objects without tracking, is in my opinion, somewhere from around 24 millimeters uh, up to 85 millimeters. And the reason is, is that the shorter the focal length, the longer we can expose. So we can expose maybe for five or six seconds at 24 millimeters, and then only two seconds at 50 millimeters, let's say. Um, so star trails are the limiting factor to how long we can expose for. And again, star the reason that stars trail is due to the Earth's rotation. 
Um, in the 24 to 85 millimeter range though, anywhere in there, we can usually at least do like one to two second exposures at a minimum. And that's gonna give us some decent signal if we do really bright DSOs. Personally, I try to avoid going under around one second exposures for this technique because it's hard to overcome the noise when you go really, really short. And so, and then the reason I don't suggest um, like uh, going to fisheye or 14 millimeter lens is uh, at that focal length, you're, you're basically into uh, landscape astrophotography territory where, yeah, it will be a, you can get a really beautiful shot of the Milky Way, but the, any deep sky object is going to be really, really, really small on your sensor. So you're not gonna resolve much detail when you're at 14 or 10 millimeters or something like that. So at 24 millimeters, you can start to resolve some of the bigger bright nebulae. Um, and for me, uh, the, the sort of really ideal is something like 50 to 85 millimeters, because that's sort of right in between where you can resolve some detail but you can also do somewhat longer exposures, like one to two seconds uh, for each exposure. Okay, and that's it for equipment. Now, there are additional accessories, of course. There's always more things you can do in astrophotography, but I'm gonna try to keep it really simple tonight. I'm not gonna use a Badenov mask, as I may have mentioned in my past video. They typically don't work that well at 50 millimeters or under anyways. So we're just gonna manually focus on a star and just try to get it as small as possible in the live view of the camera. I'm also not gonna be using anything to control um, possible dew formation on the lens. The reason I'm not gonna do that tonight is because since the Lagoon Nebula is basically low on the horizon, the lens isn't gonna be pointed up. And usually when the lens is pointed this way, I don't have any dew problems. It's only when it's pointed straight up that dew collects on the lens. Um, but if you are shooting something that's straight up, one really easy way to prevent dew is just get some hand warmers that are like activated by shaking them and then just rubber band them around the lens. So that's it for equipment. Uh, it, it, at 85 millimeters or 70 millimeters, you might optionally want to get a Badenov mask because they really do start to work well at that focal length, um, but you don't need one. Next, we have to figure out where to go shoot. And the unavoidable truth with astrophotography is the darker the sky you can shoot under, the better your results will be. And so you can try to work around that fact. You know, I, I do a lot of narrowband work, so these are really expensive filters, so I can shoot in the city. And that works pretty well, but the truth is, no matter what kind of gear you buy, you still have this unavoidable issue of light pollution. And if you can get under dark skies, your results will always be better. All that said, you can definitely still try this out if you live in the city. It's just, uh, if at all possible to get somewhere dark, go for it because it's just amazing. You'll, it's a better experience and your photos will be better. Now I'll say if you're brand new to this and you're planning you know, to spend some money on a camping trip or something to go try out astrophotography under dark skies, please practice first from wherever you live. Don't make it your first time trying astrophotography on an expensive trip. Because things like focusing and using the camera in the dark can be pretty hard your first time out. And so if, if, you could, if you've practiced those, you'll, you'll feel ready for that big trip to the dark site and I think you'll, you'll have a much smoother experience. If you're not sure where to go to find dark skies, um, there's a good website for trying to estimate how dark a location will be. It's called lightpollutionmap.info. And what it does is it uses satellite uh, imagery and surveys uh, to estimate how light polluted the skies will be anywhere in the world. If you're new to the night sky, it's also good to download a planetarium app on your phone and learn how to use it a bit before going out. Um, they're not hard to figure out. The cool, and the cool thing about using these apps is they make finding stuff much easier because they use the phone's compass and gyroscope to tell you exactly where in the sky your deep sky object should be. You just hold it up, you line up your camera uh, with where it says it should be on the phone and, you, and adjust the tilt a little bit until you find it on your camera's live view and you've found it. And you can, you can look at star patterns and things like this to make sure you're in the right spot. And you can even change the time in the app so you can do some planning ahead of time. This is what I do a lot of times. I'll, I'll plan to see when the object is gonna rise, how high it's gonna be in the sky. 
And, and for example, if the app says something like, well, this uh, deep sky object's only gonna get five degrees off the horizon at its highest all night, then you can forget about shooting it. That's too low. Um, my rule of thumb is like something like 15 degrees is as low as I'm gonna go, and that's if I really have a good horizon. The lagoon, which we're shooting tonight, I'm gonna put it in the lowest part of my photo, and it's gonna be about 20 to 23 degrees for a few hours. But keep in mind also that trees and can be uh, buildings can be a really big hindrance, so the best kind of location to find is one that has something called good horizons, meaning if you look out, there's no obstructions close by, like a big field or a, or a body of water, like a lake or the ocean. Sites like this that are really have good horizons and are dark are called dark sites. And uh, ask around because um, a lot of local astronomy clubs, um, you know, might know where these are in your area. Okay, to calculate uh, my exposure time, I use something called the NPF rule. If you're interested in why I use this rule as opposed to something like the rule of 400 or rule of 500, I've made a whole video about that topic, which you can find on my channel. Um, to uh, calculate the NPF rule, I use the original source calculator. So you can find this on Google by Googling something like this or um, I'll put the link uh, in the description of this video. So we're gonna pull up this website. It is in French, um, but if you're using Chrome web browser, there is a little handy um, translate, uh, Google Translate uh, tool right up here. So I'm just gonna switch it from French to English. And then it gives me a, an okay translation of this page. So if you're interested in how the rule works, uh, there's a bunch of information here at the top and way more at the bottom for understanding it. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this calculator right here, starting at where it says camera details. And if you have a newer camera, don't try to choose anything right here. You're just going to enter in your information manually. Um, and the way to find this information manually is um, just to again google and uh google the name of your camera so i'll do canon eos r and then do uh pixel size and often the first thing that will come up is this digicamdatabase.com and i have found this is a good source for this information and so here where it says pixel pitch, 5.34 microns, that's what I would put in right here. And then for number of pixels and width and height, I think you usually have to uh, scroll down a little bit on this page on the Digicam database till you get to sensor resolution. And then the first number is always the width. So, six, seven, four, one, and the second number is the height. Okay, so it's it's that simple, just Google, Google your camera name plus uh, pixel size, and usually the first um, thing that will come up is a handy website like this one, Digicam database, that will allow you to find all that information and put it in manually. Now, if you have an older camera like me, instead what you can do is just choose the, uh, the make and the model right from this list and it will fill in the information for you. Everyone I think is gonna be dealing with a color uh, sensor, uh, so just leave that alone. If you have one of these kinds of sensors, you would already know and you can choose that. For the focal length, we're doing 50 millimeters and F2. Okay, um, this is marginally important. Uh, it really it really matters if you're shooting directly north, uh, then you can often get very much longer exposure times because uh, you're closer to the North Star, or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, directly south. Um, but for other things, it doesn't matter so much, but We'll use it anyways. Um, we're gonna be shooting towards the southeast where the Milky Way will be. And the latitude of our shooting location is, let's say 46 degrees. And the target height above the horizon I said was 23 degrees. If you don't know these things, just 
guesstimate. Uh, you can use your planetarium application to try to figure them out. Um, okay, go ahead and click calculate the exposure time. And then just scroll down to this yellow box and the information that we want is in this uh, grid of nine squares. You can see that for my camera, uh, it's telling me two seconds. You know, on this corner, maybe we could get away with 2.1 seconds. But if you if you get a uh, something like 2.5 or something like that, just always round down. So because usually a camera can't do uh, something like 2.5 anyways, so you're just going to be rounding down anyways. So we've figured out our exposure time is two seconds. It does compare that to other rules here, a simplified MPF rule, a rule of 500, and a rule of 500 uh, with equivalent focal length. Oh, by the way, uh, this equivalent focal length thing reminded me. A lot of people have asked me, should I try to figure out the equivalent focal length when I enter in my focal length here? No. So even though I'm using a crop sensor camera, I'm not going to change my focal length here because this calculator calculates everything it takes everything into account you don't have to go ahead and try to figure out an effective focal length just put in whatever the lens says on it uh, right there um, and put in the information as accurately as you can and this will be the answer this will be the max exposure time we can get until uh, stars start to streak or get out of round all right, the last thing to do um, before leaving the house is just to make sure all your gear is ready to go. And that means uh, charging your camera battery to full. If you have an extra battery, charge that one to full too. Um, if you will get into this, but it, uh, make sure you have a good memory card, you format it so that uh, it's ready to go. You have plenty of space. You can also bring an extra memory card. I'm really into extras of everything, so, uh, don't feel like you have to buy extras of everything, but it's just how I am. I always have extras. Um, we also want to make sure that our camera is on all the right settings before we leave. And so let's go through all the menus on this um, Canon 60D um, and make sure set up for deep sky astrophotography. But if you have a different brand and, you know, then things will be a little bit different than this. Uh, Nikon's a little bit different. Sony's a little bit different. But if you don't see a particular setting, don't worry about it. Um, just follow along as much as you can and it should work out fine. There's really, you know, only a few really important settings and I'll, I'll definitely highlight those as we go through. Okay, I'm gonna start in the quick menu here, which you just get by pressing Q on a Canon camera um, and most uh, DSLRs have some kind of quick menu like this. And I'm gonna set the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. I'm not gonna set them to the values I think I'm actually gonna use for shooting, which would be uh, something like F2, ISO 1600, and I think we found out two seconds. Um, instead, I'm going to set them a little bit more aggressive, which I use for framing. So just for finding my object, I want to go as fast an aperture as possible. I want to go a little bit more aggressive on the shutter speeds, so a little bit longer exposure, and I usually pick an, a higher ISO. And this just allows me to see the image a little bit clearer to see if I have it framed up, if I actually uh, have it framed up on the Milky Way as I want. And then when I'm ready to shoot, I change these values back to what I actually want to take my hundreds of pictures with um, to get round stars and things like that. Okay, so again, just set these a little bit more aggressively than you would normally. A little bit higher ISO, a little bit uh, faster f-stop and uh, longer exposure. And then you can dial them back to what you want after you've found your object. The other thing that I do in the quick menu is instead of having it on single shooting, I always put it on two second timer. Um, I find that really useful when I'm trying to find my object because then I don't have to hassle with an intervalometer or anything else. I can just take a two second delayed picture. So it's, it's, it's going to be sharp because I'm not actually hitting the shutter button and it takes the picture immediately. It waits two seconds before taking the picture and that way I can get a sharp exposure that lets me know if I'm in the right area and uh, how focus is and things like that. 
Uh, other thing I can set in here, we could also set this in the main menu, is how I want it to take the pictures. So right now it's set to RAW plus JPEG. I actually don't need a JPEG, I just need the RAW. So I'm just gonna turn off the JPEG option there and just get RAW frames. If you forget everything else, just always make sure before you go out to set your DSLR or mirrorless camera to RAW. You, it's much better um, and you can actually calibrate your files if they're in RAW mode. If they're not, it's it applies a transformation inside the camera and you won't be able to properly calibrate with darks, flats, and bias. Um, also in here, we have our white balance mode. I always just put this on uh, daylight for astrophotography. It doesn't really matter since we are shooting raw. We can always we're always going to change the white balance after the fact in post processing. But just as a habit, I always put mine on daylight. Everything else is looking pretty good here. Let's go ahead and go to the big menu now. So I'm just going to hit the menu key. Okay, we already set our quality, but just to show you, you can also set it in there. So we have it set to raw. I always turn off any kind of sounds just because I find them annoying at night uh, to deal with beeps and things. Um, I also turn off the image review. Um, this can be handy when you're framing, but I find it's just as easy just to go into playback mode, then I can look at the histogram and things like that in playback mode. And the problem with having image review on is once you actually start taking your pictures, it uh, will turn on that screen every few seconds and that can really heat up the camera uh, and drain the battery and do other bad things. So we don't want that. So I'm gonna turn it off. Um, most of these settings are not really, don't really have anything to do with astrophotography and will not have no impact basically. Things like picture style are just for the JPEG transformation so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, like I said, white balance doesn't really matter too much if you're gonna do a the processing like we're doing. Color space, again, that only applies to the JPEG transformation and won't be an issue for raw files. Um, sometimes, uh, oh, so yeah, sometimes uh, you'll see an option in these menus. It's not on this Canon 60D because it's too old, but for um, something related to ISO, like a, like an ISO noise reduction or some kind of noise reduction option, if, you ha if your camera has that, I would recommend turning it off. I know that sounds sort of counterintuitive. We want to reduce noise, but um, it messes with calibration, and calibration is how we're going to really reduce a lot of unwanted noise. So I would turn any kind of noise reduction option off if your camera has it. Um, live view shooting, we want enabled. And we do want exposure simulation enabled too. That just makes the, the picture brighter in the live view. Okay, these are mostly about playback. The one thing that I wanna point out here in the playback mode is this histogram option. So you can set your histogram and playback to brightness or RGB. Both are really useful. Uh, for evaluating exposure overall, I usually just leave it on brightness, but sometimes it is really helpful to go into the RGB histograms and see where your different channels lie. Because a lot of times um, you wanna at least get your weakest channel, which is usually red, off of the noise floor, meaning off of the very left-hand side of the histogram. This is more applicable though to tracked astrophotography, so it doesn't really matter for us too much. Um, okay, uh, auto power off. I usually set this to something really high or even just disable it entirely. I'll just set it to 30 minutes because uh, when I'm working, I don't want to have to deal with auto power off. Auto rotate, I turn this off and I would recommend everyone do that because um, I have seen with the stacking programs, auto rotate uh, somehow getting interpreted and messing up the stacking. So I would turn it off. Um, format, so this is where you can format your card. I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm not sure what's on this, but I do recommend it uh, just to make sure you have enough room. Um, so go ahead to you know, back up your entire SD card and then format it before you go out. And it's, it's always best to format it in the camera uh, to, for the best results rather than, you know, erasing things on the computer. I always format on the camera to get uh, a very clean starting point. 
Okay, I usually turn my LCD brightness up uh, all the way um, when I'm, it's really useful for when you're framing objects, when you're trying to understand, you know, do I have it in frame to have that LCD brightness high? Then after you've found your object, you can go back in here and turn it back down, um, if you remember, because it does save on battery to turn the LCD brightness down and can also uh, help with your night vision. Date and time. It's very important, I think, to set the correct date and time because uh, later on you're going to want to remember, well, when did I take those files? And, uh, you know, I, I sort of remember I took some files of the lagoon on August 3rd, but if that date time is set wrong, then you don't know when you took them and it's not as helpful. Um, okay, sensor cleaning. Um, this one. Uh, can be good to have the auto cleaning, um, but what I usually do is actually, um, before I start doing any astrophotography, I do the auto cleaning on the sensor. And then I turn auto cleaning off. The reason for that is that um, if for some reason you have to change a battery or something like that, um, and then you put the battery back in, you power your camera back on, it does the auto cleaning, you know, automatically when you're turning the camera off and on. And if you haven't done your flats yet, then the auto cleaning can, can mess up the dust uh, particles on your sensor and then your flats won't match your lights. So I always, dis I always do a cleaning and then disable the sensor cleaning property. That's how I get around that. Okay, I think we're, we've reached the end here of the options that matter. So that's it. Um, we've gone through all of the different camera options and set them up for astrophotography. All right, tonight we're going to see how a stock DSLR compares to a full spectrum DSLR. These are both Canon 60Ds, but one has been modified for astrophotography. And we're gonna be shooting HA emission nebulae. That's where it really makes a difference between modifying your DSLR versus having a stock DSLR. And so if you've been wondering, does it make sense for me to modify my DSLR? This uh, little test um, should help because we're gonna be using the same lens same camera body, the only difference here is that one is modified and one is not. Okay, it's starting to get dark, but it's not quite dark enough to start uh, shooting our lights yet, meaning our pictures in the night sky, but we can start shooting our calibration frames because I think the temperature is stabilized. And so I'm gonna start with my uh, bias frames. And to shoot bias frames, what you're gonna wanna do is uh, cover the lens so that it's uh, completely dark. So I'm just gonna put my lens cap on and it's just pointed at you know uh, the dark sky. And then I'm going to uh, set my shutter speed to the fastest it can go. So for this camera, that's one eight thousandths of a second. For some cameras that might be like one four thousandths of a second, but just set it to as fast as it can go. And I'm gonna do everything at ISO 1600. I have found that's a good ISO value for this camera. Okay, and then I just wanna take a bunch of these. So I could either just uh, set up an intervalometer or what I usually do since uh, camera shake and things like that aren't gonna matter is I just put it onto continuous shooting mode and just hold down the trigger uh, for a while uh, so that I can take 100. Um, or so. If you don't uh, want to do it that way though, you can always use your intervalometer. Okay, and then I'm going to take uh, my dark frames, which should be the same exposure length as my lights. And I know from the NPF rule that we're going to do two second lights tonight. So I'm just going to set this to two seconds keep the lens uh, cap on the lens so that we're taking these com in complete darkness, keep the ISO the same, and then I'm just gonna take uh, about 30 or 50 of these. I'll use my intervalometer again. Okay, and for my last type of calibration frame here, these are flats, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this LED tracing panel, 
that I bought for about $30 off of Amazon. And I'm going to put it on top of the lens here with the camera pointed straight up. But before I put it on, I have this sort of uh, tracing paper diffusion material on attached to the lens with a rubber band. You can also use a clean white t-shirt uh, to do the same thing. Basically the diffusion is just so that we can get slightly longer exposures and avoid any uh, banding issues. Okay, and then the way I'm gonna take these, I've just put the camera into live uh, view mode and I'm looking at the screen here. And I can see that two seconds is way too bright because when I hold the shutter button down halfway, it tells me that's over three stops, overexposed. So I'm gonna bring this down to, let's try one eighth of a second, it's still overexposed. Okay, and I'm just looking at that little meter down at the bottom. Now at 1 15th of a second, we're about one and a half stops overexposed. Okay, if I bring it down to, I'm gonna say it's somewhere around here, 1 40th or 1 50th of a second looks about right. Let's try 1 50th of a second. I know you can see some some very quick banding there. Uh, that's, that's fine. I think that 1 50th of a second is gonna be long enough to avoid it, but we'll see. It's going to go ahead and take a picture and I'm going to press the info button and you can see there is our uh, histogram mountain and you can see that it is about one third of the way over so that looks good. Um, I usually um, err on the side of a little bit underexposed flat rather than overexposed. Uh, Right in the middle is fine too, but a little bit underexposed has always worked for me as long as you're you know, seeing the entire histogram mountain. It's not clipped on either side and it's at least a quarter of the way over on the histogram. Usually that kind of flat will work fine. The other thing that I'm looking for here is that uh, if I click the info button again, that all three color channels are represented. So you can see that in the RGB histogram there. And if I look at it, that I'm not seeing any banding issues um, that happen sometimes when you take a short flat like this. And what those would uh, look like is horizontal dark lines across the frame. I don't see any banding issues, but I'll probably take a few more flats just to make sure that they don't pop up. And then if I'm happy with this, I'll go ahead and take about uh, 30 to 40 flats. Okay, it's now time to focus. Usually I focus on a bright star in the sky, but since Jupiter is out and that's uh, brighter than any star, I thought it would be uh, good for this example just because it's so bright that we'll be able to really see it easily in the video. Um, and so uh, even though it's not a point source, it, it should work okay for uh, this example. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is just make the star as small on the screen as possible and uh, using manual focus. So you put it onto manual focus mode on your lens if there's a switch and then you'll just use the focus ring uh, back and forth until you find that spot where the star is the smallest it can be. And usually this takes a little bit of trial and error and I've found that on a bright star when you get it to the smallest uh, focus point usually you see a little chromatic aberration, a little bit of pink magenta tone around the star. And the other thing to look for is smaller stars should all of a sudden just pop out. So basically, when you really get into focus, you'll see these little small stars just sort of pop out of nowhere. Um, and with Jupiter, you can really see it here because Jupiter's moons are really not visible until we get into focus. And then all of a sudden you see that little, those two little moons right to the side of Jupiter here. Okay, now it's time to point our camera at our deep sky object. Um, the Lagoon Nebula is also known as M20, Messier 20. And so I'm just using the free application Sky Map here on my Android phone uh, to find where it is. I'm just holding it up in front of the sky and I can see it should be in this direction. So I'm gonna point my camera in that direction and then just use the live view uh, to find it. All right, I've now found uh, the Milky Way and the Lagoon Nebula and uh, so so I'm gonna go ahead and take a test picture. There we go. Um, I can see the Milky Way there. Uh, it's a little bit cloudy still, but hopefully those go away. Let me uh, zoom in here so I can uh, show you where the lagoon is in this. The lagoon is pretty easy to spot because even in this uh, three second test picture, we can see some nebulosity. 
And then we can also see the nice cluster of stars in the lagoon core there. So this is looking pretty good, but I'm going to go down to two seconds to make sure that I have pinpoint stars. Now I'm going to go here into my quick menu and actually set this up for um, shooting. So ISO 3200 is a little too high. I'm going to bring that back down to ISO 1600. Um, I have a rule of thumb that for older Canon cameras like this, I always pick either 800 or 1600. And for um, untracked astrophotography like this, I always go with 1600. Um, I'm not going to get into the reasons why, but that's what I do for these cameras. Um, for the shutter speed, we found from the NPF rule that for this camera and this 50 millimeter lens, we want two second sub-exposures, so that's what I'm going to set it to. And for the aperture, before I said I was going to go with f2, but I've changed my mind last minute here, and I'm going to go wide open at f1.8. The reason is, is just because from this dark site, I think that I need as much light as I can get. And just looking at some of my test shots here, uh, I'm comfortable with f1.8. I'll accept the sort of uh, weird stars on the edge, which I'm going to crop away anyways. So. Okay, so that's it. We've set our shutter speed, our aperture, and the ISO correctly. Last thing I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna turn off the self timer, set it to single shooting. Okay, if you have an external intervalometer, you would now be ready to program that and start your sequence that way. Since I'm using an internal intervalometer via Magic Lantern, I'm just gonna hit the trash button on my Canon camera here. And to enter the Magic Lantern menu system, and I'm just gonna go over here to the intervalometer option, turn that on, press Q to set the options. I actually want it to take a picture every three seconds because I want to give a little bit of time for the mirror to um, open and close and not uh, cause vibration issues. I should say possible vibration issues. I've never really seen them. Um, I'll start the trigger, meaning start the sequence after I leave the menu. And I want it to start after 12 seconds because I want to give plenty of time for me to sit back and get away from the camera and not stomp around too much. And I'm going to uh, do 150 shots and then at that point I'm going to check focus, reframe, that kind of thing. Um, have a, I've had a lot of questions about what to set this to. How do you know how long you should go before you reframe? Um, it's really sort of a, a guess, um, an educated guess. Uh, you don't want to let it go too long because then you know your your main subject will be get too off center and you'll have to do so much cropping in post. Um, but uh, you also you know want to give it a good run before you have to constantly be checking it. Um, so I usually do something like. Uh, 100 to 200 or something like that um, and that's with these low focal lengths like 50 millimeters if you're shooting at something like 200 millimeters untracked then you would want to um, set this much lower set it like 30 or 40 and reframe um, more consistently through the night um, so that you don't have to crop uh, so much because you know, the more zoomed in you are, basically, the more you're going to have to reframe to keep your object centered on screen. Okay, that's good. Take a picture every two, three seconds. Start the trigger after leaving the menu and start after 12 seconds. Okay, take 150 shots. Okay, that's it. We can now hit the trash button again to leave the Magic Lantern menu and it'll start the sequence. Okay, so we're back inside, and the first thing we have to do to actually start uh, processing our files is actually get them onto the computer 
organized. And I'm actually gonna start with the camera um, because uh, in playback mode on the camera, it's really easy to actually understand which files are which because um, most cameras have an info button that then gives you some metadata about the file uh, in playback mode. And uh, that way I can just quickly see not only um, visually what kind of file it is. So obviously the ones with stars will be lights and the ones that's all uh, bright like this is a flat. But when it comes to the files that are completely black like bias and darks, it's hard to differentiate those without the metadata. So looking in the upper left-hand corner here, it tells us the shutter speed. And so a dark would have a shutter speed that's the same as the light, two, two seconds. While a bias frame would have a shutter speed that's one eight thousandth of a second, which is the fastest uh, shutter speed this camera can do. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna open up uh, Notepad on my Windows computer here. Uh, there's also a program called Text Edit on Mac. Both of these are just quick note-taking uh, applications. And I'm gonna type in lights, darks, bias, flats, because that's the order that I took these files in. And I'm just gonna take note here of the file names, the range uh, of each type. So we can see the first light here is ends in 831, the file name. So I'm just gonna type in 831 dash. And then I'm gonna press the zoom out button and just use my uh, scroll wheel here. to scroll down until we see something that doesn't look like a light frame, meaning we don't see the Milky Way anymore. It'll turn probably completely black eventually. Took a lot of light frames. There we go. Okay, so you can see starting with 1135, this is a completely black frame. And because it's two seconds, I know that it's a dark. So the, f the last uh, light frame is 1112. And then I guess I deleted some files, probably because the clouds came in. And then the first dark frame is 1135. Okay, now I'll just keep scrolling until up there in the upper left hand side of the screen, it changes from two seconds to one eight thousandths of a second. And then I know this is my last dark frame. So one, one, eight, zero. And my first bias frame is one, one, eight, one. Okay, and then I'll just keep scrolling until we get to the flats. Looks like I took about a hundred bias frames. There we go. 1280 is the last bias frame. And then my first flat frame is 1437. I know that's a, a huge jump there in numbers. Um, I deleted some things from the card just to make this a little bit uh, easier. Um, so then I'll just keep scrolling, whoops. And my last flat frame is 1465. Okay, so now I have everything, all of the information that I need to organize these files because I have the file names and uh, the numbers here and what type of file they are. And so now what I can do is I can just remove the memory card from the camera and take my memory card reader here. And this is a nice USB 3 memory card reader that's nice and fast for transferring the files to the computer. It's made by Kingston. And it also has slots for other type of memory cards if you have a camera with CF or something else. Um, Okay, and it says blah, 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 I don't care. It opens up that in the File Explorer. If you're on Mac, this would be Finder. And uh, if, it, if it does, if your memory card opens up in some other program, some Photos application, just close out of that, we don't need it. 
What we're gonna do now with uh, this window open over here and our notepad file here is we're going to copy the files off of the memory card onto the computer. But before we do that, um, let's make some empty folders to transfer them to. So I'm gonna make a new folder on the desktop, just right click and choose new folder, and I'll call this Lagoon. And then inside my Lagoon folder, I'm gonna make four subfolders, just the same way. Right click, new folder, and I'm gonna make one for lights, one for darks, one for bias, and one for flats. Okay, now with these two windows open, here's my memory card. I'm gonna go in here into my picture files, and here's my empty folders on my desktop. I'm gonna start with lights. And so lights go from 831 to 1112. So I'm gonna open up my lights folder over here on my memory card, I'm gonna click on the first file, 831, and scroll down till I get to 1112. There it is, and hold down Shift and click. And so Shift click makes it so that you can grab the whole list of files. Then I'll just left click and drag to drag these 282 files over to my lights folder and let go. And it copies them. Okay, the copying is done. So now I'm gonna go back a folder just by clicking on Lagoon. And next I'll go into Darks. So I'll click on the Darks folder. It says the folder is empty. Then I'll just copy over from 1135 to 1180. So I'll click once on 1135, scroll down, shift click on 1180, copy those to my Darks folder. Well, that's going, I can look the next, it's bias 1181 to 1280. So open up my bias folder, click on 1181, scroll down to 1280, shift click and click and drag 100 bias files. Okay, and then finally, flats is everything else here. So we'll just copy those over to the flats folder, and then we'll be done. Okay, all done. The only other thing I wanna say about um, file organization here 
is uh, that if you, you are using Deep Sky Stacker, um, when it stacks together all of these bias frames to make a master bias, it leaves that master bias file uh, in this folder. So if you have a previous project that you worked on and you still um, have all of these folders, look in your bias folder and there's a master bias file in there that then you can reuse for project after project. You don't have to um, take the bias frames all over again and restack them. You can save some time just by reusing a master bias file. So that's why I, I shot 100 bias frames just to get a really good um, master bias file. And then we don't have to actually shoot those bias frames again. We can reuse that master bias file over and over again. Okay, I'll close out of this stuff. And now let's go ahead and open up Deep Sky Stacker here. Okay, this is Deep Sky Stacker 4.2.3, the 64-bit version. The first thing I'm gonna do here is go down here to settings and go to stacking settings. And right here where it says temporary file files, where it says temporary files folder, you can see that I have mine set up to an external drive, the D drive, which is just a an external hard drive I have connected. Um, but yours might be um, on the local drive. And that's fine as long as you have plenty of hard drive space. But um, if you don't, for some reason, I would recommend setting this up um, to where you want it to go, where you have plenty of space, because these temp files can get really, really big. Like it, since we're stacking hundreds and hundreds of frames, these, these temp files can get up to like 60 gigabytes. Now, they are temp files, meaning they're temporary. They only are, are there when you have the program open, and then when you close the program, they're deleted from your hard drive. But still, you need the space. So if you're working off a fairly small like startup drive, like an SSD, um, you may want to uh, pick a different location for this temporary files folder like I did. Okay, with that said, we can now open up our picture files. This means our lights. And so I'm just gonna navigate here to the desktop and then to my Lagoon folder into my lights subfolder. And I'll just click on any of them and then press Control A to select all and click open. Okay, it brings them in. Um, for some reason, uh, Deep Sky Stacker has this quirk where I think it's because you could just bring in all of your frames all at once and it let it try to figure out which are your light, dark and flat and biased. But I really wouldn't recommend that because it might mess something up. So what I usually do is I just bring in my light frames first, but none of them are checked right now. So then I go over here and just click check all. Okay, and then it tells me I have 282 light frames. Okay, then I can click over here on the left-hand side under open picture files where it says dark files. Just go to my darks folder. And again, click, press control A and open up all my dark files. And it tells me I have 46 of those. And then I'll open up my flat files. Open those, 29. And finally, my bias files. Open. Okay, we're not using dark flats. Uh, you usually only need to use dark flats if you're shooting really, really long flats, like 30 seconds or something like that. Uh, uh, if you're using a slow scope or something like that. Uh, but we we shot very quick flats, so we're, I'm not worried about dark current noise and we don't need to correct the flats with dark flats. Anyways, uh, we have all of this set up now. Um, we can now go on to this red highlighted thing down here that says register checked pictures. Okay, um, let's start with the main uh, window here under actions. So we have register already registered pictures. These are not already registered, so we can leave that unchecked. We have automatic detection of hot pixels. It's fine to leave that checked. We have stack after registering. I'm gonna go ahead and check that. I want to just do this all in one process. Sometimes you break it up and you might wanna register first and then look at the scores and do different things with that, but let's just keep this simple and stack after registering. 
Um, I have 282 frames, so I'm going to tell it to select the best 95% of pictures and stack those. So it's going to throw out the worst of the five, the worst five percent of the pictures, which I'm fine with. Uh, I think there's some which have maybe some passing clouds or some where maybe I'm I'm re reframing and the stars are 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 streaked and it deep sky stacker will do a good job of finding those kinds of things and throwing them out because they won't be considered in the best 95 percent okay i'm going to go over here to advanced and just make sure that my star detection threshold is okay i don't remember what the default is but let's just start at 20 percent and then press compute the number of stars and it found 117. If I bring that star detection threshold down like that, you can see that it finds slightly more stars. And if I bring it up, it will find fewer stars. Um, so at 36%, it's only finding 59 stars, which um, might work, probably would work, but I usually like to get over 100 stars. So I'm going to bring that back over to 17%. And that gives me 147 stars. As long as you're seeing like something between, let's say, 50 and 30, 3,000 stars, it's probably going to work just fine. If you're seeing like 20,000 stars or zero stars, then those are outliers and I think something is going wrong. So then you would really want to examine your files, especially the zero stars. Um, that would mean that you probably didn't get focus right because if it's not finding any stars, then, then it's not going to be able to stack your pictures. Um, so uh, I, then you're going to have to take a look at your files. Uh, you could open them up in Photoshop or something like that ahead of time and see what the issue is. But usually this works just fine, and you might even be able to just leave it on the default, but I always like to check it. Um, okay, and then I'm going to click on Recommended Settings. And what I like to do in here is just sort of scroll through and see if there is anything that is popping up in red. That usually indicates this is something you should address. Um, I mean, it says you are stacking 282 light frames here. That's sort of in red. But I mean where you're seeing all these green statements. What the green indicates is that those are settings that it considers um, already set and that are appropriate. If you're seeing something in red, um, then that means something that you haven't set or, or that you maybe should pay attention to before you start the process. But for the most part, the default values in Deep Sky Stacker work pretty well. If we go into stacking parameters, Um, there's some different options in here, standard mode, mosaic mode, intersection mode. You definitely don't want mosaic mode. That would mean that you get, uh, that's for if you are basically taking a mosaic of the night sky. We also can think of this as a panorama, something like that, where you're, you're putting together a bunch of different pictures to make a bigger picture of the night sky. But what we want to do is actually stack the pictures all together um, to to um, average out the noise in the picture. And for that, you can either use standard mode or intersection mode. Basically, the difference is just that standard mode isn't going to crop away anything. It's going to leave in the rough edges, and intersection mode will automatically apply a crop. But I don't necessarily trust it, so I always just leave this on standard mode and do the cropping myself afterwards. Okay, um, you want to use all available processors down here at the bottom. Don't want to turn on any um, drizzle or aligning of RGB channels. Usually um, this thing, you know, the different uh, clipping modes work just fine in the defaults. I have uh, the lights on Kappa Sigma clipping with a Kappa of two and then darks, flats, and bias are all on median Kappa Sigma clipping. I have alignment set to automatic, the intermediate files. This is sort of interesting. You can either choose TIFF or FITS. So that if you 
were working with other ast astronomy programs, you might choose FITS, which is the more standard for astronomy programs. But since we're going to be working mostly with just Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop, um, TIFF files are just fine. This is interesting. Um, if you are finding that even with your calibration frames, your darks are mostly supposed to, are the ones that are really supposed to take care of hot pixels. But if you find that you, you stack and you calibrate and stack and everything, and then your result still has a lot of hot pixels, you might want to try this um, cosmetic correction right here, where it can try to detect the hot pixels that are remaining automatically and um, change the value of those so that they're not as noticeable. Okay, we want to create an output file. The autosave.tiff is fine. So basically, my point here uh, is that I'm just using all of the defaults. Um, I'm on standard mode for result. And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And click OK again. And it gives us a final um, summary of everything that uh, we've told it here. Um, you can see that I did 200, I have 282 light frames at ISO 1600. Um, you can see my bias darks and flats are also all at ISO 1600. Because we have 282 light frames at two seconds each, that's a total exposure, total integration of nine minutes, 24 seconds. Um, and the process will temporarily use 31.2 gigabytes on the D drive. So you can imagine if we instead had over 500 frames, um, this may take up something like 60 gigabytes. So you can see these temporary files really do add up. Um, so just make sure you have enough space um, before you start. I don't think it will actually let you start the process if you don't have enough space. Um, but remember, if you if you want to set that temporary drive to some other place, just go down here to settings, and uh, you can you can set that temporary drive wherever you wish. Okay, this all looks fine. I'm going to go ahead and click OK again. And now it's the waiting game. Um, basically, this uh, can take hours. Uh, it really just depends on how uh, modern your computer's processor is, how many threads it has, that kind of thing. Um, I don't believe uh, Deep Sky Stacker has any GPU acceleration, so it's really just using your CPU. And the really, again, the most important thing is, uh, is just if it's a more modern, more powerful processor, um, this will go faster. I'm just using um, a Lenovo ThinkPad. It's a few years old, so I know this is going to take my computer hours to finish, but that's fine. Um, I'll sometimes, you know, take a break and do something else or leave it overnight and then uh, pick it up in the morning. So um, I'm going to fast forward or skip this part of the video and uh, we'll see what it looks like when it's all done. Okay, it did take a few hours. I actually just uh, waited overnight and this is the next morning and we have a finished uh, picture here. This has been uh, calibrated, registered, and stacked. Now, it doesn't look like much right now, but this is completely normal. This is actually what you want to see. You don't want it to look uh, bright at this point. You want it to look black with only a few white dots. Um, this is because it's unstretched or in a linear form still. And then we're going to do the stretching and all of the um, linear to nonlinear curve work not here in Deep Sky Stacker, which is a fairly uh, crude way to do it, but in another program like GIMP or Photoshop or etc. Um, so to it actually is already saved. Um, so if you look right up here, um, it tells you where it's saved. So it's saved in my lights folder as autosave.tiff. The only issue with this autosave.tiff file is that it is a 32-bit floating point file. And some programs, um, I know GIMP, um, and even some versions of Photoshop um, won't play well with that 32-bit file. So what I would recommend um, you do just to make sure that you have compatibility with the programs we'll use next is go over here to the processing um, section on the left-hand side and go down to Save Picture to File. 
And this lets you save off a 16-bit TIFF file, 16 bits per channel, which is what we want. Um, the default settings here are the ones you want, compression set to none, and under options, you want embed adjustments in the saved image, but do not apply them. You want that checked. And so then I'll just save it as Lagoon DSS for Deep Sky Stacker and click Save. And then we can see here on my desktop, this is what I'm going to bring in to the next program, lagoon-dss.tiff. Um, and then while we're here, I'll just mention really briefly, if you do want to reuse your master bias frame in future projects, what you can do is in that folder at the bottom, you should see something called master offset ISO whatever dot tiff. And this is what you would save to reuse. Um, uh, and you don't have to reshoot bias frames because they're technically the same um, every time, as long as you shot them correctly. Okay, that's it for Deep Sky Stacker. We'll move on to the next uh, section, which is the fun, creative part of uh, processing and really bringing this data to life. Okay, I've switched over to my Mac uh, just because that's where I have Photoshop installed. Um, and then I transferred the resulting 16-bit TIFF file from Deep Sky Stacker to my Mac. And then I'm just going to open up Photoshop. I have Photoshop CS6, um, mainly just because I haven't uh, bought Creative Cloud or don't want to pay the monthly subscription. Um, and CS6 works fine for everything that I do. Um, but there's a few things that I'll mention here that are a little bit different. And the main one is that um, under Filter, there is no Adobe Camera Raw option under Filter in CS6. So when we get to the very end, and I'm going to do some noise reduction in Adobe Camera Raw, I'll show you how to get around that if you do use an older version like me. Okay, let's go ahead and open up the TIFF file. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go up here to the Image menu and go to Mode and just confirm that it is RGB and 16 bits per channel. If you did bring in the autosave.tiff and you were saying seeing 32 bits per channel, what you can do is you could just switch it to 16 bits and then it would say something like, are, are you sure, proceed, and you just click proceed and it, and it works fine. Okay, um, so this is exactly how it looked in Deep Sky Stacker. The first thing we're gonna do in Photoshop is we're going to duplicate the layer. So I'm just gonna right click on the background layer and choose duplicate layer. And I'll call this first stretch. And I always like to duplicate just so I have a backup in case I wanna uh, just quickly uh, check my work or, or do something with this um, original background layer later on in the process. We probably won't, but just in case, I like to have it there. Okay, so with the first stretch layer active, let's go ahead and bring up our image adjustments levels command. And you can see when you go into a menu in Photoshop, it does give you the shortcut right there. And so since I'm on a Mac, the shortcut for levels is Command L. But if you were on a Windows computer, it would be Control L. So from now on out, I'll probably just use the keyboard shortcut, but you can also get it from the menu right there. Okay, the other thing I'm gonna do in addition to bringing up levels is I wanna bring up my histograms. And if you don't see the little histograms icon over here, you can just go to Window and turn it on from here. We just want to change the channels uh, option from RGB to colors so that we see the different colors, red, green, and blue here, and we see them up here in a color display. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just going to apply a pretty gentle stretch just to the entire image to all three channels, the R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. Something like that. And click OK. And now you can see, uh, you can see a little bit more of the image and you can see these red, green, and blue um, channels come out a little bit. And we can see that they're a little bit misaligned, but if we do that one more time, it will become even more apparent, both in the image down here, which is looking very teal, and up here. You can see that 
our green and blue channels are pretty aligned, but our red channel is lagging behind here. And that's why the image takes on this sort of uh, greenish blue off colored color balance. And so there's a lot of different ways to approach color balance in Photoshop. But if you wanna do it while stretching the image, what you can do is just go here and into the channels and just pick a particular channel in the levels command and stretch it separately from the others. And the reason that I like to have this display up is because then I can see when I'm getting close with the histograms to a sort of equalized color balance where the three channels are pretty aligned. So that's looking pretty close both here in the histogram display and here in the image. Uh, while I have this open, it looks like the blue channel is a little bit skinnier than the green and the red. So another thing I can do here is I can go into the blue and I can hit both the mid-tone slider and the shadow slider. Bring the shadow slider into the right and the mid-tone slider into the left. And that will in effect stretch out the blue channel. And I just keep going with that. until it seems about as stretched out as the red and the green. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And there is this little line of red over here and up here. That's why we're seeing that, that red streak in the shadows area over here, I believe. Um, so we can ignore that, but other, otherwise, when we look at these three histogram spikes, they look pretty well aligned. And if we zoom in, we can see that the color balance is looking um, pretty good. Here's an orange star, a blue star, that kind of thing. Um, at this point, I think I want to do a few things. I want to crop, and I also want to apply some saturation boosting so I can really see what I have here. Um, so I'm first going to, I think, just apply a adjustment layer the hue slash saturation adjustment layer. And I'm gonna really bring up the saturation in the image just like that. Not that far, but maybe up to 70. And this isn't permanent. I know it looks sort of weird, um, but it's really just to see um, how our color balance is doing and where, many, where any problems may be and also where I wanna crop, where it seems like it really drops off in terms of image quality because of the stacking. Um, and what I mean by that is because uh, we didn't have a tracking mount, so we, we were realigning this, um, but obviously I didn't do a perfect job. And so there's gonna be a lot that we have to cut away out of the frame by cropping um, where we didn't have overlapping pictures. So there's a lot more noise and that's where we get these registration artifacts as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and crop. I'm just gonna press C for crop, or over here in the toolbar, you can just click on the crop icon. And so I don't want any of this over here on the left-hand side. I also wanna get rid of these cropping artifacts on the top, but I don't want to cut off the Eagle Nebula, which is right there. So I'm gonna be careful not to crop that out. I'm gonna crop in a little bit on this side as well. And the other nice thing about cropping, it really focuses in on the actually interesting part of the uh, photograph for me, which is the dark structure in the Milky Way and the nebulae. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and accept that crop. And we can see the main issue with color balance after I increase the saturation is still that it is too um, green and blue. So let's go back to our first stretch here and look what looks, let's look at the histograms with that hue slash saturation slider applied. We can see it really separated out again, the green and the blue and the red. So let's go ahead and correct that again with levels. I'm gonna do that by stretching the red, not that much. But when I stretch the red, you can see it's now quite a bit fatter than the green and the blue. So I'm gonna have to stretch them a little bit too. Okay. 
Okay, I'm just gonna look at the image here and see what I think. I think that's looking pretty good. And keep in mind with, with something like the Milky Way where it's filling so much of the frame, it might be natural actually for the red to be a little bit wider than the green and the blue because there's so much um, sort of brownish, reddish um, Milky Way stars, which are, are, are much more sort of yellow and gold and orange and red than blue. Um, so I'm gonna say that is good for now. And if I take back off that stretch, you can see that's before, that's after. So it looks very desaturated without this uh, saturation adjustment. But what we could do now is we could go back into this and bring this back down to something like 35 for now. And then I'm just gonna do some more uh, adjustment layers here. So I'm gonna bring up a curves adjustment layer and I'm going to do something like this just so we can see the picture a little bit more this is just a slight s curve I don't want to go too far uh, with um, bringing up the highlights because I don't want to blow out my stars okay with that done I can go back here into huge slash saturation and see if I increase this a little bit Okay, this is looking pretty good, at least in terms of the stars. I'm not quite happy with the how the Milky Way looks yet, but we're gonna we're gonna keep working on that. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit more color balancing here, um, just to taste basically. So I'm gonna open up a color balance adjustment layer, and I'm going to um, take out just a little bit of green. and a little bit of blue and a little bit of cyan. So I'm basically making the picture warmer. Then I'll go back into my curves adjustment layer and continue sort of fiddling with this. You can see with the picture is sort of coming alive. So here's uh, before with just the stretch. It's very uh, dull. And then here's as we're adding um, these saturation layers and these curves layers and things like that. Um, we can also, I sometimes just add a little bit of saturation directly to the stretch layer. So we can go to adjustments and add it here. Usually don't want to overdo it here. This is because this is a permanent change to that layer, but I think that this sometimes helps bring it alive a little bit. We can turn that off and on and see. That was before, that's after. And it just it just makes the picture pop a little bit more. Okay. Um, I'm gonna actually add another curves adjustment. And probably in my final image, I'm gonna to wanna to make this darker, but for now, I'm just gonna actually just make it brighter to bring out some of this detail a little bit more. Okay. Now, at this point, I am pretty happy with this star color, and I don't want to um, make the picture much brighter because it will it will affect that star color. It will start blowing out the star cores and making them pure white. Um, so what I want to do at this point with the picture is actually separate the the stars and the the nebulosity, the Milky Way and the and the the nebulae within the Milky Way. Um, and there's a number of ways to do that. One way we could do that is is right here in um, Photoshop. There is a dust and scratches filter. Okay, and you can see that could do something that could remove some of the stars and leave us with just sort of this bland outline of uh, the Milky Way and then we could enhance the colors that way. 
So that's one way to do it, but um, it, it you lose a lot of sharpness doing it that way. Um, so instead, what I wanna do is I'm gonna use a machine learning algorithm that um, someone named Nikita Misura, I think. I'm not sure exactly how you say their name, um, but they have released this for free. It's called Starnet++. And so I'm gonna just show you how to download that now. Okay, so from Google, I'm just going to um, search for Starnet++ like that. And the first uh, search result here is this sourceforge.net download site. And that's what you wanna go to. And then uh, go over here to files. And if you do have PixInsight, you can get the PixInsight module. But um, assuming you don't have PixInsight, we're gonna just get the standalone version. And so you would just go into version 1.1 here and then pick your operating system. So if you're on Windows, pick Windows or Win. If you're on Mac, pick this Mac OS. And if you're on Linux, pick the Linux one. And I'll just click on that. And then it will start downloading here. Okay, it's finished downloading. So I'm just going to open up those, uh, open up the zip folder and put it on my desktop. And also on my desktop, I'm going to save this image in progress from Photoshop. I'm going to save it as a TIFF. I don't want layers checked, so I want to choose TIFF as a copy, and I'll just call it Lagoon um, for Starnet. I'll save it to the desktop. Okay, I'm going to hide Photoshop. Here's my Lagoon for Starnet file, and here's my Starnet um, underscore Mac OS folder. I'll open that up. And if you look at the readme, this is where it's going to give us instructions on how to use it. Okay, and basically we just have to look at this little um, shell file here. Uh, this is a, just a little command that's given. Um, and if we open that up, I'm just gonna open it with um, a text editor, but you can open it with uh, any kind of text editor, it doesn't matter. Um, all we're gonna do is just change this right here to the name of our file. So I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna say lagoon for starnet.tiff. And then I want the output to just be lagoon starless. And then the last thing here is I'm just going to change the stride number to 32. What that means is that it will take a little bit longer to process than with a stride of 64, but it will give us a better result for, for removing the stars, um, especially with uh, wide field images like this one. I'm gonna go, go ahead and save that script, close out of that. Okay, with that done, we've edited the script, 32-bit uh, stride, it has the right file name. Um, we can go ahead and run the script. The way we do that is through a command line uh, program. So I'm just gonna use the built-in um, command line program on Mac, which is terminal. And to run it, we have to do two things. We first have to move to this directory. So I'm just gonna type in cd space to do change directory command and then drag this folder over. So CD space, and then go to the folder, hit enter. We're now inside the folder. And from there I can run this command just by dragging it over and hit enter again. Okay, and then it starts its thing. Um, it uh, reads the file, it tells me Yep, it's a 16-bit file with three channels. Here's the height and the width. Here's the uh, CPU I'm using with TensorFlow. Um, and then uh, 
this is the number of tiles that it's going to break the file up into and then it's going to look at each one and remove stars from those tiles and then recombine the image and then down here it tells me how long it's going to take for that to happen um, a percentage as it's going and uh, you can see it just went from zero to one percent so it does take quite a while probably at least an hour maybe two um, on an image of this size so we'll let it uh, do its thing and then we'll um, uh, pick back up when it's finished. Okay, it took it about an hour and now it's completed. Um, so we can see here in the same folder, there's now a Lagoon starless file, which looks like this. Uh, you can see uh, there are some blue star halos that uh, look a little bit ugly, but for the most part, it did a good job of removing the stars from the image. So now what we can do is open back up Photoshop and open that image. So I'm just gonna do file open and open the Lagoon Starless image. And I'm just gonna play around with this a little bit. Um, just open up a curves adjustment and just add a nice S curve here to make it really dramatic. Actually, I'm going to take care of this little uh, reddish corner a bit here. Let me just uh, open up a hue slash saturation and I'm going to bring down the saturation. Then I'm going to fill this layer mask on the hue slash saturation with black. So uh, we can just do edit fill with black. Okay, so that basically uh, made this null, but then I'll just use a little gradient here in the corner to bring that back. So I've just set up a gradient here that goes from black to a mid gray, and then I'll just uh, draw in a little bit up there and continue to turn down the saturation in that corner just a little bit. Okay, so there's before and after. Just tone down that redness in the corner a bit. Okay, uh, now I'm going to go ahead and take my star layer here. First I have to create its own layer, so I'm just gonna do Command Option Shift E or Control Option Shift E on Windows, and that's just going to take what's visible right now and create an, a new layer out of that. So Command Option Shift E or Control Option Shift E on Windows uh, makes a new layer from visible, and it's right over here, layer one. I'm then gonna select that layer with Select All and copy it and paste it onto this image, the starless image. Okay, and then with this layer, what we can do is just apply a screen blend mode. So you can see right up here, right now it says normal. I'm just gonna change that to screen. Okay, and you can see this uh, image is now a lot more detailed than this image because uh, we're layering the stars on top of the starless image. Um, the only issue with it is that it's too bright. So I'm gonna now uh, open up a curves and reset my black point and apply a tiny bit of an S curve here. Like that. And then the last thing I'm gonna do here is uh, the whole thing appears too saturated now. So then I'm going to reset the saturation point just with a new saturation uh, slider. And I also just think it's just a little bit too bright still. So I'm gonna take down the um, opacity of that of the stars layer just a little bit like that down to 90 percent
And I still feel like this corner is a little bit too red. So I'm actually gonna double up this uh, hue slash saturation layer up there. So there's different ways we could deal with the um, these sort of purplish star halos. One way is we could go, could turn off this layer here for a second and we could deal with them directly in this starless layer by uh, clone stamping them out. Um, but that's gonna take a long time. So instead, what I'm gonna suggest we do is just use the Adobe Camera Raw um, magenta and green halo reduction thing. Um, I don't know exactly what they call it, but uh, you'll see it here in a second to deal with that. And then while we're in Adobe Camera Raw, we can also apply some noise reduction to this image because it's only a like a 10 minute uh, total integration. So it is fairly noisy. Um, and so we can, we can bring down the noise a little bit, but I'm basically happy with how the colors look and, uh, and how much uh, detail we've we've gotten out of the lagoon and Trifid especially, but we also see a little bit in the Omega and Eagle up here at the top. And, and also some nice detail here in the center. This is called the Sagittarius Star Cloud. Um, okay, so to bring it into Adobe Camera Raw, if you have Adobe uh, Photoshop Creative Cloud, you can just go up here to filter and there should be an option somewhere in here for Adobe Camera Raw filter, which is really easy. But since I'm on an older version, what I do is I go to File, Save As, and I'm just gonna save to the desktop and call this Lagoon Final. And I don't need layers, so I'm gonna turn that off. I'll go ahead and embed the color profile. Save that TIFF, and then I'll open it right back up. So I'm gonna click on lagoonfinal.tiff, but then where it says format right here, I'm gonna change this from TIFF to camera raw and click open. And then that will open up the image in camera raw. I'm on version 9.1.1. Um, and there are two tabs that I wanna use in here. The first is this lens corrections tab. Um, you can use uh, automatic lens profile corrections. It's just, uh, but it's not finding it since we did all this work on it. So let's just uh, not use that. Let's go right onto color and click on remove chromatic aberration and then drag this uh, purple slider over a little bit like that. And I can just turn this off and on and you can see that it took out a lot of the purple out of the image and made it uh, made those really aggressively big purple halos on some of the stars uh, less noticeable. And, and you can play around this with this slider. So initially I'd put it at four and then when I look at the change it made to the image, maybe I think it took out a little too much purple. So then I might bring it back down um, to like three or two. And if you are noticing any green uh, noise in your picture, you might also play around with this removing green um, chromatic aberration too. I don't think that's making any difference on my image. Oh, maybe a little bit, I don't know. I'll just leave it at one. Okay, the other thing we can do that I mentioned is we can apply some noise reduction. And for this, I recommend um, zooming in a little bit. So here's our Lagoon and Trifid. And then I'm gonna go to the Detail tab. And I'm just going to apply a little bit of color and luminance noise reduction. So I usually start at around 20 uh, for both of these. And then just let the detail tabs just sort of uh, go automatically. You can also uh, play around with sharpness. So one thing that happens is when you apply noise reduction, your image can look a little bit uh, blurred because that's basically what it's doing is it's blurring at, at a particular scale. 
Um, so then you can bring back some of the image sharpness that you've lost through this sharpening right up here. And so it's basically a dance between all of these different sliders until it's uh, something that you like. And so what I'm always doing is I'm turning this little preview uh, check mark off and on to see what it's doing to the image. And I also like to look at it at different scales. So, so far I like what it's doing. I wanted to zoom in on this part of the image. Yeah, and in every view that I've looked at so far, I like it better with the noise reduction on, so that's good. And I'm just gonna zoom out and look at the whole thing again. And yeah, I'm, I'm uh, happy with how this image is looking. So uh, now it's just uh, saving it, or you can, you can open it back up into Photoshop if there's something else you wanted to do, like if you wanna continue working on crop or colors or whatever, you can just click open image right there. But I'm happy with this. This is basically my final step. So I'm gonna click on save image. So uh, from this save options uh, thing, you can save it as a Photoshop document, a DNG, JPEG, or TIFF. Um, for now, I'm just gonna do uh, TIFF and call this Lagoon Final 2. And then I'll also go back into that same save image thing and save it as a JPEG for saving on for sharing on the web. Uh, call it the same thing. Okay, and I'll say done. And then I'm just going to take a look at my final image here. Okay, and now the moment of truth. Uh, as I mentioned a few times in this video, I was shooting everything with two different cameras using the same 50 millimeter lens. One camera was the stock 60D, that's what we just processed. And then I also shot it with the modified 60D and did the processing as closely as I could to be the exact same so that we could do this comparison at the end. And here is the result. So we have the stock 60D on the left and the modified 60D on the right. And uh, you can see that we do have some color differences. Uh, both the color of the Milky Way um, is a little bit different. It's a little bit more yellow in the stock 60D example and a little bit more reddish magenta in the modified. The biggest color difference I think is this star cloud. Uh, in the stock 60D, we have these really brilliant blue stars and in the modified 60D, they got a little bit purple and a little bit not as uh, extreme. Uh, you can really see that's a cool uh, explosion of blue stars in the stock one and the modified one. Uh, I don't think it makes quite as much of an impact. But what do we gain by going modified? Well, the first thing that I notice is that uh, this we have some star bloating, maybe I would call it. The stars appear a bit bigger on the stock 60D and they appear quite a bit sharper on the modified 60D, especially if you look in this region right here. And the reason for this is because the stock 60D still has what we call an optical low pass filter or an anti-aliasing filter installed in front of the sensor. While with the modified 60D, we've removed that. So um, we, get, we can get sharper stars. The downside is that if you were shooting something like a brick wall or something, you might get artifacts uh, with the modified 60D, which you wouldn't with the stock. Uh, the other big difference, and you probably already noticed this, is that the HA emission nebulae, like the Lagoon Nebula down here, a little bit in the Trifid, the Omega up there, and this guy right here, I call it the Twiddlebug Nebula, I think I read that online, are much redder and more detailed on the modified 60D compared to the stock. Um, you can see the Lagoon gets a lot more filled in and it looks a little bit um, better, I think, than on the stock 60D where it gets a bit more blown out, it's a bit more noisy. On the modified 60D, it looks uh, this really nice uh, sort of bubblegum pink color. Um, and then when the Twiddlebug Nebula, really we're, we're, we are getting some faint HA emission in the modified and really nothing in the stock. So that's a big difference too between those two. 
Other than that, though, I think uh, they're both, you know, just 10 minutes of data. So there's still both quite noisy. If uh, we did longer uh, integrations, we could, we could get these looking a lot better. So just keep that in mind. This is just uh, really a test and for education purposes, don't feel like these are finished pictures necessarily. Hopefully this comparison illustrated some of the differences if you're uh, considering modifying. I will say that uh, modifying does make daylight uh, photography a little bit more challenging. You can get filters that will return it to the original white balance in most cases. Um, so if you're considering modifying and still want to use your camera for daylight use, you might consider that. Or you can also always uh, shoot a custom white balance. So whenever you're out uh, shooting in the daytime, you can bring a white card and shoot a custom white balance and get pretty natural color that way too. Um, but you can see even with trying to get the colors uh, is as similar as possible uh, in my processing, I couldn't quite do it. Uh, I was trying to get the Milky Way to look like this and the stars to look like my stock 60D here in the modified version, and it just wouldn't uh, let me get to the same colors uh, without really screwing up the rest of the image. So I will say that uh, if you do modify your camera, you're never gonna get back to probably completely natural color, but for most people, the trade-off is well worth it because of the sharper stars and the uh, greatly increased uh, HA emission sensitivity. Okay, this has been uh, Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you uh, did and you wanna support this channel, uh, please consider subscribing, liking the video, leaving comments, and also uh, you can join me on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. You're about to see everyone who has already joined me on Patreon, uh, everyone who signs up on there gets their name in the credits if they wish. All right, till next time, clear skies.